Good morning. Absolutely wonderful to be with you here today. Thank you for plowing out your driveways and shoveling to be able to get here for our early service uh, at Good Shepherd. As the Croyleers um, from St. Croix Lutheran Academy are here with us uh, to sing the praises of uh, our incredible God. Uh, my name is John Enter. I'm one of the pastors on staff at St. Croix, and it's my honor as well to be able to share God's word with you today. Uh, the theme of today's service is behind enemy lines. And man, that's what Jesus did. He, he left heaven to come down to earth, to come where the devil is, has ruled and reigned over hearts and lives of the people here for so long, uh, to save us and to rescue us. And so that's where we'll be focusing uh, our attention here today. Uh, the Croyleers will now sing our opening song, O Church Arise. May the Lord bless our worship. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, 
I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, grant that like Simeon and Anna of old, we may see with eyes of faith him who is the glory of Israel and the light for all nations, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom you and the Holy Spirit we adore now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our Old Testament reading, as you see on the screen here, is from 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, I'll read through and pause along the way and make some words of note of application for us. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Now, backstory that's going on here, you see where this book is taken from or this account is taken from Samuel. So um, Hannah, years before, was in the temple, just destroyed, distraught, crying, praying, pleading with God that God would open her womb and she'd be able to have a child. And the high priest at that time saw her and thinks she's like drunk and out of her mind. And it's just that she was pleading with God. Well, God opened her womb. And what she had prayed was, God, if you allow me to have this child, um, I will give the child after this child is weaned to you. And so that's what's going on here. The husband's going and it's about time the child's going to go into the temple. And she's like, I'm not quite weaned with the child yet, but I promise I will fulfill what I said I would do to the Lord. Verse uh, 23 then. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Uh, Only may the Lord make good his word. Weaning back then could be three, four, even five years old. Um, So this is a little bit longer than we do in our day and age. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Uh, um, Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. We must have that in there twice. All right. Uh, After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. Eli is that high priest that had seen her uh, years before, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked for. So, now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Here ends our Old Testament account.
Please rise. Our gospel lesson today will also be the basis for our sermon message. I'll read. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms, praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel and the tribe of Asher. She was very old and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who are looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Here ends our gospel message. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
about 2,000 years ago, when Mary and Joseph were making that trek, that journey from Nazareth in Galilee down to Judea, down to Bethlehem, because of course you know why uh, Joseph belonged to that house and line of David, and there was that census that was going on. How difficult that journey must have been. Do you remember how Mary was described in the Bible? Great with child. <laughs> Like how painful that journey would have been to go along that way and to get down there. And then they get down there. They get down to, to Bethlehem. And as you remember, there's no place for them to uh, bed down for the night. And Mary Olsen goes, oh, honey, it's time. <laughs> and we read right through this. But imagine the tension, the terror, the difficulty, the fear that would have been as Mary and Joseph First-time parents, and I remember when, when Debbie gave birth to our first child, I was clueless. I was so terrified. Could you imagine what the scene, what the scenario would have been, would have been like? Um, Mom, Arndt, I got a question for you here. Um, so let's say you're, you're pregnant with your first child, and um, you are great with child, okay? Uh, and the two of you, you're, you're driving through the backwoods of, of nowhere, Wisconsin, and all of a sudden you go, honey, it's time. <laughs> And you go frantically looking for a hospital. You can't find one. You pull up onto a farm place. You can't get in. No one's home. But the barn's open. And, oh, baby's coming. How comfortable are you having husband deliver baby? Eh, <laughs> that's pretty good. How comfortable would you have been? Not at all, right? But, see, the thing is with Scripture, we, we, this account is so familiar. We read through the tension, the terror, the difficulty that would have been this time. God blesses it. I don't know how silent that night would have been with the delivery happening or even how holy it, it would have been with everything that happened. But Mary and Joseph have the joy of little baby Jesus being born. And in the weeks, in the weeks after this, and that's where we are right now, we're in the weeks after Christmas, everything would have been relatively calm for this, this young family. Mary's recovering from the birth and settling into her new role as a new mom. Joseph went out and took care of his responsibilities for the census, which is the reason they went there in the first place. Undoubtedly, Joseph has gone out and he, he's tried to find some work on the side, maybe as a carpenter to, to feed his family. Everything's been really, really quiet. Until about right now. About this time on that first Christmas, in the weeks after the first Christmas, they'd have been gearing up for yet another trip, another journey. Uh, when Violet, our firstborn, was born, I, I remember literally pulling out of the parking lot. You know when you pull out of the parking lot, there's that little dip when you go on the road. And I was like 1.2 miles per hour. Like, is the baby okay? Like, I, I didn't want to venture out with our child, like, at all. And here they are going on another trip. Why? Well, this was in our text. And we read right past it. The reason why they are going on a trip is because they're heading into Jerusalem. Now, from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, not a long trip, but still, it's a trip. And you're carrying God's Son, the Savior. This is probably the, one of the first times that they are venturing out. But there was, see, two Old Testament laws that they were fulfilling. And it was right there in our text. The thing is, and maybe you've heard this account before in Scripture, we tend to read right through those first few verses of this Old Testament law stuff because we don't really get it. And we want to get to the, the cool story of the cute old man, Simeon, who scoops up the baby. Like, th there's the meat. That's where our heartstrings go. But anytime I preach, I, I really like to be a, a teacher preacher. I want you to learn something new about God and God's word that maybe you didn't know before. And then especially to grow deeper in God's amazing love for you. And so I want to take a moment here to explain the why. I want to take a moment to explain why they're going in to Jerusalem with these two Old Testament laws. Now, one part is for Mary and one part is for Jesus. I've highlighted the part about Mary in yellow and Jesus in blue. So let me read it and then I'll explain it. So here's again the beginning of our text. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, that was for Mary, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Now we go back to Mary. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. All right, let me break this down for you. So 40 days after giving birth, every Jewish mama 
needed to go back into Jerusalem and to offer a sacrifice because through the birthing process, she had become ceremonially unclean. Old Testament, if you came in contact with um, blood or a dead body or those different things that made you ceremonially unclean and you couldn't go in the temple for a while, you'd offer in sacrifice and then you could go in. So do you remember when Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs? That was a major slam. <laughs> oh, that was a big slam. And it goes back to being ceremonially unclean. Do you remember uh, in the Old Testament, there were three different times they were required by law to go into Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. And if you're walking into Jerusalem and you stepped over a grave, you became ceremonially unclean. You came in contact with a grave, a dead body. And so they would literally whitewash the tombs. They would paint them like a bright white leading up to these ceremonial times that the Old Testament Jews would go into Jerusalem. And what Jesus is saying is, Pharisees, you look so pretty and you look so white and you look so good, but inside of you is a rotting death. And if someone comes in contact with you, they're not and please, uh, God's not pleased with them. That's a slam. <laughs> That's a big old slam. Now, Mary could not go into the temple for these 40 days. So in Leviticus chapter 12, the Jewish mamas then had to go in to give a sacrifice. Um, two doves, if they were wealthy. Two pigeons, if they weren't. All right, so that's why Mary's going. But it's not just Mary. It was also Jesus. In Exodus chapter 13, all firstborn males were to be consecrated over to the Lord, given into service, basically over to the Lord. Remember Elkanah and his wife Hannah gave Samuel in consecrated service over to the Lord. All right, interactive time for the sermon for a second. Does anybody know Exodus chapter 13? What's going on in Exodus chapter 13 that God would say every first four males of the Jews be consecrated to the Lord? What's, what's going on time-wise here? Anybody know? I, I heard a whisper. No whisper anymore. <laughs> Book of Exodus. So the Israelites exiting Egypt. Remember the tenth of the ten plagues? What was the tenth of the ten plagues? The death of all the firstborn males in Egypt. And so Exodus 13, God says, every firstborn male, both men and animal, of the Jewish family, a nation, is to be given over to the Lord. The animals, their necks were broken. Well, God wasn't for child sacrifice, but then he had sacrifice happen on behalf of the child. Unless you weren't going to redeem the child, you were going to give the child into service. So Numbers 3 says that you could do a sacrifice to redeem your child from service to the Lord if you didn't want your child to serve Jesus or serve the Lord the entire time. Now, our text is very clear in saying that when Mary and Joseph and Jesus go into the temple, they just offered the sacrifice for Mary. The two doves or two pigeons. Because they only need to consecrate or need, uh, do the sacrifice for Mary because they don't need to redeem Jesus back from service. They knew who Jesus was. They knew Jesus was this miracle child of this miracle birth come to bring the miracle of forgiveness to the entire world. They knew they didn't need to go into the temple to sacrifice for Jesus to redeem him. They knew that Jesus had come into this world to redeem us. And that's right there in the text, but we read, we read right past it. They knew who Christ was. But see, everybody else was oblivious. Everybody else in that temple was oblivious. I wonder how many people saw this young couple that was there and maybe looked on them in disdain. I wonder how many people, as they were rushing around inside the temple, they were oblivious to God in the flesh right there among them. How many of them were oblivious? They literally cut in line in front of, of, of Jesus, cut him off in the line of the sacrifice. I wonder how many people did that. When, when Joseph went into the temple area to buy, uh, presumably because they were poor pigeons, for Mary's sacrifice, I wonder how many of the animal vendors that were there price gouged him. And they're price gouging God. They were completely ignorant to what was going on. Uh, I think this is a cool thing to show you. This is a model of the temple in Jesus' day, Herod's temple. 
in the bottom section, you see the circle and the stairs and the semicircle that go up. That bottom section is called the court of women. That's called the court of women. And because Anna is there, because Mary is there, that's more than likely where this encounter, this interaction took place between Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna in that bottom section. But again, everyone around completely oblivious to what is going on here until there was one that wasn't. Until Simeon comes over. And you remember how he was described here? It says that he was righteous and devout. Oh, Lord, that you would describe us like that. Righteous and devout. Think about that for a second. Righteous, meaning doing the right things to each other. Righteous in your your living here on this earth. Righteous and devout. Devout to God. Faithful to God this way. Faithful to God this way. What an incredible description that God gave of him. Righteous and devout. And, And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. We're not told how he was told. We're not told if he had that um, come to him in a dream. Sometimes that happens in the Bible. We're not told if an angel appeared to him. Sometimes it comes that way. We're not told how he knew, but he did know that he would not die till he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so this old man moving as fast as his body could crack and creak and shuffle and move, goes over, scoops him up. Now, if someone baby snatched my first daughter, Violet, from me, I'm probably going to deck him in the jaw. (laughs) If someone baby snatched Violet from my wife, Debbie, Mama Bear is going to come out. And I wonder if Mary and Joseph have that instant reaction as well, Then they hear these words. Sovereign Lord, Simeon said, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. This prophecy that he was the promised one of God. This is now... The second time there is a public announcement of the Savior being born in the world. Of course, you probably know the first one. So those shepherds who are buying in the fields nearby, keeping over their watch of their flocks at night. You know, I I marvel at who it is that God chose to tell about the Savior being born. Like, he doesn't go to the magistrates and the Pharisees or the the to-dos. He picked shepherds. Dirty, live out in the field, shepherds. And did you know that in Jesus' day, shepherds were so low on the rung of society that shepherds, the testimony of shepherds was not even admissible in court? And that's who God picks, the dredge of society. And then to pick an, old, an older man who has passed his prime in the eyes of society, and then... Not just the shepherds, not just Simeon, but also Anna. This incredible woman of faith that God chooses to let the Savior be known to. And what a testimony that is for us, because who am I? I'm a nobody. Who are any of us? But God chose us. God chose you, and God loves you, and God sent the Savior to you and to your heart. Oh, what peace that gives. Anna, how was she described? She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, this woman of faith holding on to the truth of God. Everyone was oblivious. Everyone was oblivious. Besides one more. Well, the devil knew. The devil knew. I'm sure the devil heard that announcement that was made by those angels to the shepherds. Today will cause uh, good news of great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a what? A savior has been born for you? Oh, the world was oblivious, but the devil wasn't. He knew. He knew. 
And when Simeon scoops up baby Jesus and makes this proclamation of who he is, the savior of the nations, the devil knew. Oh, he took notice. You know, I imagine the devil in hell at this point rising up the um, other demons that are there and saying, boys, let's get him. He, he's here. He's among us. And God is dumb enough, dumb enough to put on human flesh and weaken himself. Boys, let's get him. Rise up. He's here. We've done this once before. We had Adam who was perfect but human, and we got him to sin. We had Eve who was perfect a human, but we got her to sin. Let's get him. Let's destroy him. Let's make him fall into sin, and we win. God is dumb. We are wise. Let's go. What do you got? Imagine a demon suggesting, well, what about Herod? <laughs> we got him on our team. Do you remember what, oh, oh, Satan, we got him to do with his brother's wife. He stole his brother's wife to make him, uh, her, his own. Let's, let's use Herod. Perfect, the devil says. And he works this fear, this fear into the heart of Herod to send those soldiers to go kill all the babies in Bethlehem. But God knew in advance, send a warning and sent Joseph and Mary down to Egypt. And little does the Satan know, he helped his own demise. Satan comes back to his followers and says, they, God got us, he knew in advance, and we fulfilled prophecy. We gotta be more careful. But we gotta get him. Years later, I imagine another demon going, well, Satan, Every single year, Mary and Joseph go up to, to Jerusalem. They're faithful to Old Testament laws. How about, how about we get them to forget Jesus? He's going to get scared. He's going to get hungry. He might steal food and sin that way. He might backtalk his parents when they come back for them forgetting him. Perfect, the devil says. And he works distraction into the, the hearts and the vision and the focus of Mary and Joseph and they leave little boy Jesus. But what does he do? He sits in the temple and stays faithful and does not sin. Do you remember how the Bible describes the interaction when Mary and Joseph find Jesus? They get back to Jerusalem. They spend a couple days looking for him. And, and he goes, wouldn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Now, to Mary and Joseph, what does that sound that sounds kind of sassy. Um, God doesn't take it as sassy, and, and it wasn't sin. But then the Bible says that Jesus was obedient to them. Do you know what that probably means? Jesus got a whooping. <laughs> he probably got a and yet he did not sin. Years later, I imagine another demon going up to him and saying, Oh, Maleficent Master, you took out Adam and you took out Eve. Let's send you to go tempt this Jesus. Perfect again, he says. And after Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, hungry to the point of concentration camp, I'm going to die. He tempts the Christ to turn rocks into bread and abuse his power and throw himself from the temple to test God and to bow down and worship the devil and call it quits on humanity and we'll just split it evens here on this earth. And Jesus does not sin. Jesus thwarts the devil, not using his power as God, but using the power of the word, the same word that you have access to. Satan, what, what if we wait until he goes back to his hometown where he's going to be comfortable and let his guard down? We'll get him riled up. We'll get him mad. Maybe they'll like throw Jesus off a cliff. And that happens and Jesus walks through the crowd. Men, we've got to do better. What about Judas? I imagine one of them saying, he's wavering. Perfect, the devil says. And he works a greed into the heart of Judas and fear. And he works fear into the hearts of the Pharisees and a jealousy into the hearts of the Pharisees and a mob mentality into the people that was there and a fear of Rome. And they got him. They got Jesus on the cross. And I imagine down in hell, uh, Satan and his followers throwing a party of all parties. We got him. We destroyed him. The world is ours. 
as the lifeblood of Jesus drains out. As Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The party in hell got louder. Until it didn't. Until the moment of the death of Jesus, there's a massive earthquake. And I envision someone in hell saying, what was that? And the devil trying to save morale goes, oh, it was nothing. But you know it was everything. Because at that moment, the curtain in the temple tore in two. Do you, do you remember what this is all about? That in the temple, there was this, this holy room, the, the most holy of holies. And it was a perfect cube. And inside was the altar of God. Inside was the ark of God. It was God's throne room on earth. That was what it was designed for. And there was a thick curtain between the holiness and perfection of God and us, the sinful people. But at the death of Jesus, that tore in two. Because now there is no separation between a holy God and a sinful people. And when Christ destroyed the power of death and rose on Easter Sunday, he fulfilled what he came to do. And that party, that party, in hell stopped. The party in hell stopped. For God won. Until it didn't. Until the devil said, but wait. Men, rise up. Demons, get ready. Do, do you remember? Do you remember the prophecy of that old man Simeon? Do you remember what he said? We ain't out of this yet. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many. There will be ones who will fall. Not everyone will rise. There will be ones who will fall. So that the hearts, that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. I imagine the devil at that moment saying, we ain't out of this yet. Yes, Christ died and Christ has risen and forgiveness went out to all, but it only counts if you believe it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And it only counts if you believe, and if you believe it, there will be some that will fall. Men, demons, we ain't out of this yet. Rise up and destroy their focus. Friends, don't think for a second that since it's a Sunday morning and you got up early and you shoveled your driveway and you got yourself all looking presentable and you got up for an 8 a.m. worship service, don't you think for a second that the devil goes, well, they're on God's team. <laughs> we lost out on them. He hates that you're here. He hates it. But he's not giving up on you. Maybe at this point he's not destroying your faith, but he's going to destroy your focus and that can affect your faith. The devil can use that to lose faith. So be on your guard. That the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. And what are your thoughts that you really don't want to be revealed? Way too often what the devil does is he gets us ticked off, mad, upset about policies that are out there. Um, and maybe there's policies that happen at your work. Maybe there's policies how you feel about these masks. Maybe there's policies happening here at church that you don't care about, or school where your kid goes to, or society, and we get so fired up and we sin in connection with reacting to policies. It destroys our focus. Maybe for you it's politics. Oh, wow, how ugly these last weeks have been, and they only continue to be. And believe me, I could be sitting right here and me preaching to me right now because I have sinned and fallen into this. I gave this warning when I preached and, and did devotion for our faculty this last Monday, and I said to the, the other teachers, my fellow teachers, two men, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, who will never know your name, we're going to sacrifice friendships and family relationships because of this. The devil adverts our focus with policies and politics 
and personality conflicts that happen in our family or in our workplace or here at church or the pressures that are this world that are on us and we crack and we break and the devil cheers because he reveals our thoughts of many hearts that cause falling. So he did to Judas. He found his weakness and he exploited it. And no, the devil does the same against you. The devil is like water. Here's this road designed to hold the water on one side, the left, not to get to the right. And for some reason at that particular place, at this long road that was there, there was a weak point in that road and the water worked and the water worked and the water broke through. And the devil, he, he's like water. And he's going to work and work and work to break through, to destroy. And when he does, don't make excuse. Don't make excuses. Don't cover up. Go to your Savior. Go to Christ Jesus who loves you, who's forgiven you, who cares the world for you, who said, over my dead body, I will have them be mine and have peace that you are. Have peace that you are. It is uh, two weeks away. Two weeks away from the Super Bowl. Today's a big, uh, big Sunday. If you're a Packer fan or other fans that are out there, sadly, my team is long gone out of the, uh, the playoff picture here in football. But we had two weeks away from Super Bowl. Um, anybody here big uh, football fans? Got any football fans in here? A couple people raising hands going out here. All right, I saw your hand first. Can you name the winner of every single Super Bowl? We're in Super Bowl 55 now. Every single Super Bowl winner, can you name them from one to 54. Do you know that I can? You're, you're impressed by this. You know that I can? Are you ready for this? The winner of every single Super Bowl is this. The team that scored the most points. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> right? It's not that hard. That's how you win, right? They won. Here's the deal. Jesus won. He scored forgiveness for you. He brought love and grace for you no matter what you've done in your life, no matter how big or how often. Jesus won. And he has given you, he has granted you, he has lovingly permitted over to you that victory. So friends, have peace. Have a growing peace in your heart that God won. He won you from the devil. And he holds you secure. So keep your focus. Keep your focus on Christ. And in him, you're always safe. Amen. Please rise. Please join with me as we make a confession of our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. O light of the world, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Arouse us and our missionaries to flood the world with the light of your gospel. Look with favor upon our nation. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and law enforcement. Watch over our loved ones near and far, that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and disheartened, 
Give hope to those in despair and comfort those who mourn. Be gracious to all and lead us to reflect your love in everything we say and do. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. Bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Good morning. What a uh, pleasure and privilege it is to worship with you this morning at Good Shepherd. I'm Brian Schult. I'm the Director of Mission Advancement at St. Croix Lutheran Academy. And uh, again, we are privileged to be here. Uh, Good Shepherd is very well represented in our student body at St. Croix, and we want to say thank you for all your support. So the current year, uh, COVID has brought uh, a share of challenges, just like it has for your church. And uh, it also brought some blessings. And so one of the things that I wanna share with you uh, is our fine arts project. Because, the, uh, uh, because of COVID, the students learned uh, from a distance in the spring, and so that allowed construction to start early. And as a result, we were able to uh, open our new facility to our students when they came back from Christmas on the 6th of January. So I wanna give you a quick photo tour. Normally, uh, by this time, we would have had a dedication and uh, you all hopefully would have been able to see it uh, in person. Uh, this is a brief tour and we hope that uh, we're able to have a dedication soon where we can invite all of you to come. So the first thing you'll notice is the curb appeal has changed significantly. Uh, it's, it, it's really a beautiful sight at night. Uh, you can see the sign illuminate uh, through the windows and uh, we actually have windows. That is also, if you're familiar with the school, St. Croix, uh, windows come at a premium and so we have lots of glass to let in natural light in the front of the building and uh, that's a blessing. The other thing you'll notice, uh, when the chapel was finished in 2005, it kind of sat out there on the southwest corner as kind of an appendage to the front of the building and now you'll see uh, that it really is a balanced and, and really a beautiful uh, street view. Here you see the entryway. Uh, we have a new secure entryway for students to enter. Uh, it, it provides uh, a level of face-to-face -face security that we didn't have uh, in place before and uh, it's, it's pretty efficient. This is the view down the hallway towards the fine arts from the uh, front of the building, from the entryway. And you'll notice that we've got uh, a gathering area out front. And, uh, this is a spot that is not only popular for the students after school uh, waiting for rides or doing their work, uh, but you will see faculty and staff hanging out there during the school day as well because uh, they have an opportunity to soak up some natural uh, sunlight. So this view is students walking from the chapel over towards the Fine Arts Center. Uh, so the, there's a link that connects the building all the way across from north to south now. And this is the view down the hallway into the Fine Arts Center. Uh, on the right-hand side, the brick that you see used to be the exterior of the building. So that's now been uh, worked into uh, the, the, an interior hallway. On the right-hand side, there's restrooms in, in the immediate doors. And then just beyond that, we have uh, practice rooms with pianos. And, and I think there's uh, four small and two large. And then on the left-hand side are the choir and band rooms. So this is a view of the choir room now. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, it, it's massive just in, in total volume, but it also has sound diffusion and, and sound absorption qualities. And so uh, the sound is, is fantastic, both for singing and speaking as well. Um, you'll see the, the panels on the wall that help with that. You'll also notice um, there is a grand piano, and that is not the grand piano from the chapel, but rather we had a generous donor that donated, um, it, it's from what I understand, the most recorded uh, piano in the world. So it's a very, very nice Yamaha seven and a half foot grand that our, our students uh, are able to, to enjoy as well. This is the band room, and so uh, again, Lots of space, lots of volume, uh, pl uh, plenty of room for the students to spread out. We've got some separation there with uh, polyvinyl panels uh, just, to, just to keep uh, everyone safe. Uh, but again, both, both rooms actually have state-of-the-art recording capabilities as well. And so these rooms give us uh, an awful lot of flexibility. And I had to share this. This is our, uh, this is our, our music storage area, and in the past, that really would have been uh, Mr. Marquardt and Mr. Fenske's office. And so now they have a separate office and we've got almost 4,000 uh, pieces of music stored with room to store more. And so uh, the facility has just been, it's been a great blessing for us. And if you would like to see it, we don't do group tours, but if you would like to see it individually, um, I'm happy to give tours and I'll be around afterwards so we can arrange for that. 
So now for the good part, we have two of our seniors uh, that are gonna share a little bit about uh, St. Croix and their experience at St. Croix with you. Uh, and I think one of them will be kind of familiar to you. So come on up. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you introduce yourselves. So we'll start. I am Zach Arndt. I attend here, as probably most of you know. Um, <laughs> I'm Amelia. I attend Peace Lutheran in Boulder, Colorado. Excellent. So Zach, we'll start with you. Um, what are some of the activities that you uh, participate in at Saint Croix? So obviously I participate in Cryleers. Um I am part of the football team. I run track. Um, I've been part of the musical. That's, that's most of what I've done. Um, I'm in Cryleers also. Um, I am on the volleyball team and I do softball. Zach, so what uh, activity do you enjoy the most and why? As much as it may not, uh, please my director, I will have to say football. Um, <laughs> just because that's, that's been my favorite sport growing up, I've, I've always loved it. I also like sports, so I'm gonna go with volleyball because I also really enjoy playing it, so. All right, so St. Croix's mission statement is to educate the total student, uh, spiritually, intellectually, physically. So how has St. Croix prepared you? Uh, on the academic side of things, the teachers really care about you. Um, if you're struggling with a, with a concept, they, they, they talk to you face to face. They, they, try to, they try to make you understand it at your level and not with all the big words that maybe they understand. So it's, it's a really personal connection from the teachers. Um, academically, a lot of uh, the classes are pretty challenging, but like they're a good challenge. So. That prepares students a lot for their future. What aspect of St. Croix um, has impacted you most? Uh, the fact that St. Croix is not like a huge public school with a thousand plus students um, is, is really nice. We only have about 460, including our middle school, so that just makes for a really good um, family environment where I'm, I'm really close with a lot of my class. I would say the majority of my classmates. I'm really good friends with. Um, the teachers have influenced me a lot. They're, like Zach said, they're really close to their students and they care about you. So that helps a lot. All right, to close this out, why don't you share what your plans are for next year? I have uh, been accepted to MLC for next year. I will be um, teacher track uh, with uh, elementary and uh, social studies, um, social studies focused. Um, I've also been accepted to MLC and I will also be going into elementary, so. Awesome. Thank you both for being such great representatives of St. Croix. Uh, and thank you again for your support of St. Croix. And uh, we'll be around afterwards, so if, if you'd like to ask questions or mingle with students, please uh, do so. Thank you. Thank you. And it's my first time seeing you all, so welcome. We welcome all of you, we welcome our guests, we welcome those of you who joined us on the live stream as well today. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements, mostly housekeeping kind of things with the service and so on. Uh, I need to thank the, the Croyaliers, the students, uh, what beautiful music. Uh, Mr. Mark Ward, his wife April as the accompanist uh, uh, for bringing them, Pastor Enter for sharing God's word with us today. Thank you all for uh, being with us. Um, you'll notice on your pews, the end of your pews, there's a connect card. If you would sign that, fill that out for us, we would appreciate that. Uh, those of you joining us on the live stream, if you would sign our online connect card, uh, there's a link there on the screen for you as well. Take a look at that. Um, the box for your regular door offerings or your regular offerings is out uh, in its usual spot for those of you who are familiar uh, out in the entryway there uh, on the usher stands here in the sanctuary is on your way out uh, are 
our regular offering plates. There we're gathering a door offering today uh, to support the ministry at uh, St. Croix as well. So uh, certainly encourage you to consider that. If you've joined us online or are giving online regularly and faithfully, uh, goodshep.com slash give. There's a drop-down menu there called Other, and under Other, there's a category for missions. And everything that comes in in that category for missions today through Saturday will be folding into the door offering and sending on also to St. Croix. So if you don't have it today, want to give online uh, or are regularly giving online, that's a way for you to continue to support that ministry as well. The last thing for you this, e this uh, morning, uh, we do have a voters forum coming up a week from today, January 31st, it's at 6.30, we'll entirely be on Zoom. Um, we'll send out an invitation with a link to that Zoom uh, meeting but 6.30 next Sunday, certainly encourage you to join us. It's a very important uh, regular quarterly meeting, but uh, a very important one as we move our ministry forward. Uh, with that, you'll also notice there on your pews, there's a baggie of, uh, with a wipe in it. If you're willing to help us out, turn over for the 10 o'clock service. Just wipe down the pew in which you sat and the one in front of you that you may have touched. Uh, that will help us get ready for the next service. With that, thank you for coming. Have a great week as you go out behind enemy lines and fight with Jesus.